Ladies and gentlemen, in this video, I'm going to tell you the funny story of how I was selected for a scan by the chess.com anti-cheating fair play team. How I had to play under monitored proctoring during a chess.com tournament and how I played a game that if there ever was a game, they would probably ban me from chess.com for cheating. And this all started on a tournament that I played on November 28th. I played a tournament on chess.com called Title Tuesday. Title Tuesday is an 11 round tournament where only title players play against other title players. I've had some good runs back in my day. All right, I've beaten some very strong grandmasters. Most recently, I beat Ali Reza Faruja. I beat the number one rated player in the world in Blitz Chess. I made a video about it, obviously. Well, this is what happened on November the 28th. November the 28th was one of the worst Title Tuesdays I have ever had. I started it by beating a 2300. Then I lost to a 2300. Then I lost to a 2500. I was one out of three. Then I beat a uh, 2300. Then I lost to a 2509. I lost three of my first six games. It was crazy. And I couldn't win. Look, then I lost to a 2490. And by the end of the event, I did manage to win two games in a row, but I went six out of 11 and I lost five games. I lost one, two, three, four, five games. When Title Tuesday began, I was 2698. And when Title Tuesday ended, I was 2653. I was even as low as 2645. I lost 53 rating points in that Title Tuesday. It was one of the worst Title Tuesdays of my life. I was getting clapped left and right. I was losing to these players who were, uh, I was actually outplaying some of these people and I was still getting terrible, you know, I was, I was still losing. That's all to say that one of the next days, I got this email. Title Tuesday, fair play check. Dear Levy, you've been selected to participate in our fair play checks. This is standard protocol, you can't see it because I'm in the way, to protect the integrity of the event. For your next Title Tuesday, you'll be asked to play on camera, which is ironic because I stream the entire thing. Please join the following Zoom link 15 minutes before the first round starts. And essentially, the rest of this email said, this protocol that we have is so that nobody is above the law and regardless of your stature you know everybody is subjected to this now this was a crazy experience i wish i filmed it i joined a zoom link okay where a vague eastern european voice started talking to me in russian because they recently watched my interview i recently interviewed denis lazovic in the russian language that's on chess kamru da ya govoriu po ruski možda vi et ne znali uh, and, uh, and, and then they told me I needed to turn on that webcam. I have a webcam right here, which is hanging on my computer. There, that's, the, that's my second camera. And then they told me I needed to share my screen. So I had to play the whole event with my whole screen shared. They needed me to do something with this other monitor that I have that you can't see because you're there and I'm here. There's two monitors in this room. I don't have one of those six monitor setups. And then like they, they had me proctored, monitored. I had to, they, they made me open task manager. And then in the task manager, I had to delete Discord, Slack, Team Viewer, any app that could have some sort of communication. And that's the way they made me play uh, the event. This might just be how it works, my friends. Like, the, you know, this was funny, obviously, but, but it's, um, it, it, this is good protocol. This is good protocol. Like, the truth is there is really no way to ensure that random people across the world that are actually playing to win online prize money tournaments, like, there's no way to ensure whether they're cheating or not unless you do something like this. Yes, there are stats and there are numbers and all that good stuff. We all know that. But this actually is a good initiative. And I was very curious to see how it would go. And I was in a room of a bunch of other title players. Some I knew, some I didn't. Uh, there, was a, there was grandmasters in there. And it's not that they suspect anybody of cheating. Maybe they do. Not me, because I suck. But uh, some of these people, right? Nobody's above the law. That's not the overlay that I wanted to open. But now you get to see my stream overlay. Here we go. I managed to play a game in this title Tuesday under strict supervision that was a monster performance. And it was one of the coolest games that I've ever played. <laughs> And uh, my opponent is a, uh, is a Ukrainian young man who's actually 13 years old. So I'm showing you a game where I beat up a child who is half my age. But I still managed to play a very, very nice game with all the anti-cheat on. And it was, it was, I just wanted to show you this game. And, and that, that was very interesting how I received that email. And I do think it is very important. I do think it's funny I was selected. Uh, but it just goes to show you nobody's above the law. All grandmasters are subject to it. Nikita played the move D4 against me. And I played the modern defense. Uh, I played uh, actually my course. I have a G6 modern course, which 
you might want to buy after you watch this game. I'm just saying. So g6, bishop, g7. And the major question when white plays the dnc pawns is if whether or not white is going to play this pawn here. You can also play this move order where you... Not, 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 not that. You can also play this move order where you prevent e4 for a little bit with your knight. Uh, but I like to do it this way. I actually like to delay the development of my g8 knight. Now my opponent took the entire center. This goes back to a completely traditional King's Indian, but in my opinion, the entire purpose of playing this slightly different move order is the fact that you don't need to go back to a King's Indian, and instead, you can play this move, Knight c6. And this is in my modern course, and I, I really like this move because you immediately put white under some pressure. You either force white to move the pawn here, or white develops the knight, which is, to me, an inaccuracy because you have bishop g4 pinning the knight, and then you can play takes. And then I really like these positions. I really like these positions where you damage your opponent's structure. And white can get in a whole lot of trouble very quickly if they're not careful. They could try to chase your pawn. And, you know, they think they want a pawn, but queen a5 check and they have to go here. And that's just, nobody's very happy about that situation. Black is doing very, very well. So there's these very nice lines. But my opponent, the young man, he, um, he knew what he was doing. He played bishop to e3. I played this move e5. I don't have to play e5 at any point. I can kind of go here. I played e5, he played d5, and the entire purpose of this opening is to jump that knight, pole vault, all right, like a track and field athlete, into d4. And the point is that if white just develops, I'm going to play c5. And once I can anchor in my knight like that, it's going to be very difficult for white to get rid of. Which is why Nikita, to his credit, played knight to e2. And now I'm in a bad situation, because if I play c5, he plays en passant, and then I have to go back with my knight, and it's very ugly. So I took... And I played this move f5, just trying to get a little bit of space and trying to play this move f4. In these positions, white is going to try to attack on the queen side because white has more space. That's what white tries to do in King's Indian structures. Black is going to try to go over here and maybe bribe white not to attack on this side of the board. Now, now here I played an interesting move. Here I played a move that if you don't know this line, you probably will not know this move. Obviously, bishop f5 looks natural, but g takes f5 is actually the better move. Allowing your opponent to check you and not just check you, you actually have to move your king. Normally, this is very, very bad. But actually, for white, this is a slight waste of time because white is going to have to move the bishop back. And black is actually pretty safe. I mean, this looks pretty ridiculous. And I would say don't try this at home or if you don't have a minimum elo of like 1200, don't do this. But now, like, what does white do? I mean, if white just castles, I'm going to play f4, right? And then I'm going to play queen h4. And position is actually not that unpleasant at all. So my opponent plays g3. I play knight f6, just trying to target the bishop. My opponent now has to get out of my position. And now, what, what, what black really wants to accomplish is probably prevent some expansion here, consolidate, like, along the seventh rank and figure out what's next. I played this move h5. I didn't actually remember what the move here was, but I, but I, I thought h5 was very logical. I will explain why. It's not that I want to go attacking. It's actually that I want to trade this bishop. That is a very powerful bishop, which simultaneously supports the expansion on the queen side, and also actually can come and pin me, whereas this bishop is sort of stuck. Like, that bishop can't really do a whole lot. So I thought in the future I will go here. This is also good to take some space. And if my opponent plays h4, I will happily put my knight on g4. But h4 is probably the best move. Uh, but my opponent here played f4 and lost his advantage. Right? He definitely has a little bit of an advantage because black played a provocative opening. I already can't, can't castle. But f4 is a bad move. f4 is a bad move because... The idea is very simple. He wants to open up my king, but he's allowing me to get a pass pawn, which is a pawn that is only stopped from going to the end of the board by other pieces, not by pawns. So I get a pass pawn, which is blockaded, but he's never going to open up this. Plus, e4 opens up my bishop in the long run. And on top of that, I have a way right now to secure a bishop. So knight g4. So suddenly, he is going to justify my entire play. He's going to let me put the knight on g4. He probably should take it. Like, between these two bishops, white should definitely lose the light squared bishop for all the reasons that I just said. The dark squared bishop helps the attack, right? But if he takes like this, then he just justifies... Like, look at my rook. My rook's a beast now, right? And if he waits any longer, I'm still going to play e4. So I'm going to have all the pressure on his position. So instead of that, he went here. That's not a good move. This is not the trade that he wants. And it's very important that you understand which of the bishops you want to give away for the knight. That's a very sophisticated kind of little decision there. So f4, knight g4. He gives me this bishop. I take right away. Now here I made a mistake. I made a mistake. I didn't want to play the move e4 right now to open up because I thought c5 was annoying. 
but the computer is really not afraid of c5. It, it, it does not think that this is scary. It wants to trade the queen. It's completely not worried about knight b5. It thinks I'm just defending everything, and now I have the two bishops. I have a pass pawn. I have two bishops. I can use my h pawn to attack. So my position kind of go, you know goes together very well. I played b6, which was a little bit a little bit not the best because I allowed him to take. And I thought that I was fine in this position, but the truth is, he might get a little bit something. And the computer is not scared. The computer, but this looks a little shaky. I should have anticipated the closing. I should have anticipated the opening of the center would have been bad for me. I should have played e4 right away, but he gave me another chance, right? And if you think about it, Nikita's move, rook f1, kind of doesn't make sense. I'm not trying to be mean or dismissive or disrespectful, but if he wanted to start an attack, I feel like he should have just taken my pawn and then played rook f1. Maybe he was worried about this, right? And that would be very tragic. My bishop comes alive. This move is only made possible because I actually played h5 a while ago. Right? If my pawn was still on h7, I wouldn't have been able to play that move. Um, but maybe that's what he was concerned about. But in any case, now we have this. And now we have to battle from this position. So I have the two bishops. Um, he has to decide where he's putting his king. Like, he could still walk the king over there. He could play king f2. Um, I also have to worry about where this knight is going to go. So I was worried that he was going to play knight b5. I thought he was going to castle in this position. And then I was going to play something like queen f6. Maybe he would play rook d2 to protect against mate, play knight b5. I would stop knight b5 by playing a6, and we would just have a very tense game. I would play here, I would play here. He would try to break apart my pawns and try to get after this. It's a very, very, very tense battle. But he played h3 first. So it was very clear to me that when he played h3, he wants to go g4, right? That's the, he wants to break apart my pawn structure. So I have a big decision to make. g4 looks very scary. Do I play a6, stopping knight b5, knight d4, and the knight is getting in there? You know, do I play queen f6? Do I play bishop d7? Very, very tough decision by me. Uh, I don't really know what to do. So I played, um, I played queen f6 in this position. I played here. I thought about bishop d7, but then the question is, what am I doing here? Well, I guess I can take, right? I can take. In a worst case scenario for me, the worst case that could happen for, for black is I let him castle, and then I, I allow the knight to get to d4, where it will then promptly go to c6. Obviously, in this case, I guess I would also just lose this pawn, so I would need to defend myself before that. So, queen f6. Here he played a move that really confused me. Here he played a move that made the alarm bells go off in my head. He played rook b1. And as you can tell from the evaluation, we go from equal to minus 0.6. Why? The idea of rook b1 actually is very logical. The idea of rook b1 actually makes plenty of sense. The idea of rook to b1 right, is to move the knight. That's it. But then the question is, why did he not castle? And the answer is, I don't know. You technically still cannot move the knight, but at least you have rook d2, right? You have rook d2, which defends mate. You can play like this. And I don't know what I would have done here. I mean, I probably would have gone here. Maybe I would have walked my king to b7. Like a6, king b1, king e7, and then like I literally would have walked my king there. Who knows? Maybe that's, you know, an interesting plan. Um, but instead of that, he went rook b1, and I realized, wait a minute, he's never going to castle. So Nikita is deliberately leaving his king in the center of the board, and I had to think, like, wait a minute, is that, is that good for him? So I played bishop d7. In retrospect, I probably should have played a6. I probably, but, because he could still play knight b5. And this is definitely the best move. So chess is all about thinking what you want, but what does my opponent want? And the truth is, this is the only piece that can pose me any problems. I'm a bozo, and I definitely should have stopped knight b5. Um, I played bishop d7 just because I was like, well, I'm developing a piece. But you are going to see in a moment that bishop d7 actually proved to be the greatest move that I played in this game. How? Like, how does that even... Well, now Nikita decided it was time to open up the position. As you can tell from the evaluation bar sliding into my favor and removing white from existence there, g4 was not a good move. Uh, it was not a good move to open up because the king is actually pretty weak for white. Doesn't look that way because I can't take anything, but I promise it is. Um, he should have went knight b5. He should have went knight b5 hoping for this trade, at which point I think I promptly lose all of my advantage because it's now very hard for me to move. And I only have pressure on a pawn, which he can just go to b3 and then play rook c1. So I'm not going to be able to get my rooks in the game because I can't make pawn trades, right? That's going to be the problem. Every trade has a winner and a loser. This trade 
Black is the winner. Why? Because after this, I get on the H file. Now, apparently, I should have just taken this pawn because him getting this is only good for me. Why? Because his king is a whole lot weaker than mine. That is a shish kebab of chess pieces if I have ever seen one. Not to mention I'm coming in on both sides, right? So it's really, really dangerous. I actually thought losing that pawn was bad. So here I play this move, rook h2. I don't have a threat yet, but the threat is to follow up with a queen check. Now, some of you may be wondering, by the way, why that's not the best move. Because in chess, you don't always give a check just because you can. You have to think, queen h4, king d2, do I have a follow-up? You need to ask yourself this question more often in chess. Do I have a follow-up? The answer to the question is no. And you don't want to lead with the queen because all of a sudden, you might get hit with a rook move, and now you're getting punished. So rook h2 first. Okay, rook h2, lead with the queen from that angle, and then rook e8 is next, defending the pawn, and then I'm going to take on g4. Here, he played g5. So he stops my plan of queen h4 check. He also gets a pass pawn, but I offer a queen trade. And I thought this was a major moment in the game, because what I anticipated happening now, and just in general, how do you decide when to trade queens? You have to think about what's going to happen and, and what the situation is when that trade happens. Okay? So in this position, who has benefited? Probably black, because black has a very powerful bishop, right? You start looking at white's pieces. Where can they go? This bishop literally has no forward moves. The knight can go to b5, but then it will get taken, and I will plant my bishop in his territory, and then I will bring my other rook. Rook g2, rook eight. Like, it, it's a very difficult position. White cannot move at all. So... Who does that trade benefit? Probably me. But he actually doesn't really have a choice. Because I realized he can't move his queen to g3. Like, why not? It's attacking my rook. It's attacking my rook, and I actually have to move my rook back. Well, I'm going to turn off the evaluation bar. Queen g3 was played in the game. Now, queen g3 is the best move for white, except black has one move that is winning. Now you may say, well, how is that the best move? Because at a certain level of chess, at a certain level of chess, the best move is the best move, but it's really hard to see. If the best move is the best move, but no low rated player is around to see it, right? Well, as it turns out, right now I have to go back h8, h7, etc. But as it turns out, I can threaten checkmate. Danger levels. Uh, what? How? Where is the mate? Pawn to e3. Utilizing the square that he just came off of, I can play pawn to e3. But that move doesn't look like it works, because the threat is queen d2. But that's very easy to stop. How do you stop queen d2? Not only is it easy to stop, I actually give myself more problems. I'm in some really bad shape now, my friends. My queen is hanging, and so is my rook. So clearly e3 is a massive mistake, because what am I going to... I have to go back. It's the only safe move. After queen c5, he takes my rook, and uh, I am completely lost. So what have I done? Well, let's put it all together. I told you a long time ago that the move bishop to d7 was the best move that I played in this game. Well, that's because in this position I played queen takes knight! And I saw that from a distance. I saw when I played queen d4 that he would move his queen, attacking my rook, thinking I had to retreat, and he would stop his thought at queen g3, e3 threatening mate. You gotta think of danger levels. And after rook d1, it is actually a very bad situation for black. If not for this move, queen takes knight. And the craziest thing about this position is he is blocked in by both of his rooks. The rooks that are supposed to defend the king have actually smushed him. He plays rook d2. And now the move that makes all of this possible, the bishop on d7 goes to a4 and the king is smothered and it's checkmate. When I saw this, I was so hyped. I saw this back here. Like when I played rook h2, I thought, oh, okay, queen d4, and I'm gonna have a. And then I went, <gasps> if this e3 threatening mate, rook d1, take, 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 
The, the pawn blocks the king, so the rook's got to block. I take the king, takes the... And, and, and the, oh my god. And bishop a4 is possible because I took the knight. The hardest thing about visualizing this is that the bishop can go there at the end and the knight can't take it. And that the pawn smushes in the king. Oh my goodness. This game got me a game review of 97%. This was a brilliant move. And an estimated elo of 3250 while playing on chess.com's fair play. Uh, after this game, they might call me in every single time. I wanted to share this with you because it was a very interesting game. I think there's like a lot of things to learn from games like this, you know? Like the fact that Black's King is a little bit weak early on. White tries to open the position. Now Knight G4, it's a question of which Bishop to trade. I like sharing games like this because I, I do think there's, you know, four to five teachable moments. Um, and, you know, creating the right exchanges and preventing the opening of the center, which I didn't do. Now closing the center down so he's not able to attack me. And these kind of moments of disallowing the knight infiltration, which I should have done a little bit faster, but the infiltration of the rook, the trade of the queens, and I mean, oh my, I could replay it a hundred times. What a move. I will relish in the victory over the young man. Uh, and uh, that's how I got summoned for chess.com fair play checks and how I passed them with flying colors. I beat seven players lower than me and I lost to four players higher than me. So everything is balanced in the universe. Um, on a bigger note, this is obviously something that the chess world will have to battle for many, many years. Players playing from remote locations without any proctoring. They're going to have to play with multiple webcams. They're going to have to open up their Microsoft Task Manager. Or whatever it's called on Mac. I don't know what Task Manager is called on Mac. Because I'm a normal person who uses Windows. Uh, no, just kidding. I'm just not a photographer or a musician or a creative person. Or a coder. Or anybody that has taste. That's all I have for you today. Hope you enjoyed the game. And uh, tomorrow I'll probably make a video about all the crazy stuff going on in the chess world here in late 2023 with the candidates. So look forward to that. Till then, get out of here.